Good morning. Welcome to Memorial Heights Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us today or you're joining us online for the first time, I'm Pastor DJ. Thank you for being part of our service. We're going to be honoring our graduates after we sing our opening hymn in, in just a few moments. Uh, but we like to start our services usually uh, with a word of prayer. So would you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Uh, we'll sing a hymn together and then we'd like to honor our graduates today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for the privilege of gathering in your name. We just ask, God, as we uh, come to your word today, that your spirit would uh, open our hearts and lead us in, in uh, your instruction. Uh, God, we pray that your spirit would be with us as we lift our prayers to you and our praises to you as well. God, that everything that we do today would be honoring to your son, Jesus Christ, and to you, uh, our Father. We love and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this uh, song together based on Psalm 23, Surely Goodness and Mercy. A pilgrim and I was I. Let's start that over. I got my words all mixed up. Let's try that again. Erase. Okay, let's go. A pilgrim was I and a wandering. In the cold night of sin I did roam When Jesus the kind shepherd found me And now I am on my way home Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me All the days, all the days of my life Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me My soul when I'm weary, He giveth me strength day by day. He leads me beside the still waters, He guards me each step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. He's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. All the days, all the days of my life. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we do want to honor our graduates this morning, and so I'm going to ask them uh, to uh, come up and just remain up here for a moment, and uh, we'll honor everyone together at the end. Uh, but we have asked for our graduates at every level uh, to uh, be honored if, uh, for whatever reason, um, you uh, did not get your graduate honored. Uh, we won't be able to do that, of course, next week in the service, but uh, we'd be happy to um, uh, get them uh, something from the church, and so you can let us know if, uh, if, if somebody didn't get nominated or, or not nominated, but uh, recognized today, uh, and we will get you something from our church to, to uh, congratulate you with. So uh, at this time, as I call your name, if you would just uh, come on up, uh, we'll start with uh, Kyla, Kyla Ruff. Kyla graduated from Frankfurt High School and plans to continue her education at Potomac State College. She'll be pursuing a degree in early childhood education. 
During her school years, Kyla played clarinet for many years, played softball, was a member of the National Honor Society, Mathematics Honor Society, and was among the top 20 of her class. She has been awarded several scholarships. Congratulations, and here is your guy. Thank you. You just stay here for a moment. Jose Ruby. Jose graduated from Fort Hill High School and will be continuing his education at Allegheny College of Maryland. During high school, Jose played tennis and bocce ball and also ran track. So congratulations, Jose. All right. You want to stay up here and stand here with us? All right. Aiden Hunt. Aiden finished up eighth grade at Frankfurt Middle School, will be a freshman at Frankfurt High School in the fall. Is Aiden here? Yeah. Upstairs. Oh, here he comes. Okay. Here comes Aiden. And while he's coming, Rowan Metz. Rowan finished up eighth grade at Frankfurt Middle School, will be a freshman at Frankfurt High School in the fall. And I'm going to let you guys grab your bags down there as I call my son Elijah Elijah Ritchie graduated from kindergarten at Calvary Christian Academy and will begin his first grade year at CCA in the fall here you go you got that all right so let's stand up here for just a oh, there you go very good so we want to honor all of our graduates one more time and uh, just congratulations on all you guys have accomplished all you will accomplish in the future. Thanks, guys. You can hit back to mommy. You guys can hit back. Thanks. At this time, after uh, pictures are taken, uh, Don's going to come and sing for us. Jesus, do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's dealing, and you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus And let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah! 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 Amen! Amen! He can wipe away the tears The broken dreams and wasted years And tell the past to disappear Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus And all the wrong turns that you would Go and undo if you could Who could work it all for your good Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes the way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and his grace is free And the good news is I know that he Can do for you what he's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah 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 Amen 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 Who would take my cross to Calvary Pay the price for all my guilty Who would care that much about me let me tell you about my Jesus, oh, he makes the way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave, ain't no sinner that he can't save, let me tell you about my Jesus, his love is strong and his faith is free, and the good news is I know that he can do 
I can't top that. I just can't. I can't. Great song. You come here, you'll tell you about our Jesus, right? Announcements. Tonight, youth will start at 6 p.m., kids choir at 6.30. After the service tonight, we are having a Father's Day ice cream social. Everyone is invited. And there's an old Baptist saying, if you have food, they will come. So. There will be no evening service next Sunday, but we are now having youth on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. So the youth will meet this Wednesday night at 6.30 during the weekly prayer meeting. We are collecting baby bottles full of change for first wave pregnancy until Father's Day. We have empty bottles up front for you to fill and bring back. There are also giving envelopes up front if you would like to give that way. Next Sunday, we'll we begin collecting items for the homeless. There will be a designated box in the foyer. Items include lightly worn socks, tents, backpacks, blankets, and related items. We'll be collecting these for the mission through the end of July. Please see Jana Hook or Paul Nightingale if you have any questions. Senior Supper, June the 21st at 5 p.m. Entree, pulled pork. Dawn and Elaine are singing. Please bring a covered dish. VBS starts July the 27th through July 1st. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you are interested in helping out, please see either Ron Morton or Stacy Michael. We will have a baptismal service on July 3rd. See Pastor DJ or one of the deacons if you or one of your kids is ready to be baptized. And uh, ushers can come forward as I start the prayer request. Prayer request. Kenny Largent has an infection in his bones and internal bleeding. Gary Wolford, this is Rick Wolford's dad who is in the hospital. Troy Van Meter, who needs thyroid or has thyroid cancer. Betty Taylor, multiple issues. Peggy Williams, who did get home this weekend. Diane McKenzie. Mike Emmerich, this is Loretta Emmerich's nephew who has prostate cancer and COVID. Loretta's neighbor, David Keener, who had a stroke and is now sick and having trouble eating. Jack Kazee, a friend of Pastor DJ, who had a stroke last week. Kenny Butts, home recovering from a successful surgery this week. Bob and Carlene McCullough. VBS is coming up at the end of the month. Others who are sick and who have lost loved ones. Pray for the citizens of Ukraine and Russia. And of course, pray for our nation. Let's go. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now as a group Dear Heavenly Father, to lift our prayers up for this long list of uh, prayer requests. You know each and every issue on this list, Lord. We know you're the great healer. Let these people feel your presence and know that you are with them. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation, Lord. Every day it gets worse, Lord, and only you can repair it, Lord. So we pray that you will do this for us, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for Russia and Ukraine. The situation there, I just can't imagine how it is, Lord. But you're in charge, Lord, and you have an, an outcome, and we just pray for a swift end to this issue. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the offering as we take it up this morning, and bless the giver and those who can give and those who cannot give. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for this service, Lord, that Pastor DJ will speak the Holy Spirit's words that he's put into his mind today, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that if someone out there listening will heed your call that to come and seek salvation, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray all this in your holy name. Amen. As we uh, worship the Lord together, this is a song we do a lot on Sunday nights. We've only done it a couple times on Sunday mornings, so as you recognize it, jump in, sing along. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will. You are the peace in my troubles, oh, you are the peace in my troubles, in the silence you won't let go, in the questions you will hold, your great love will lead me through, you are the peace in my troubles, oh, you are the in my troubled sea, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. In my troubled sea, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. Some of you wondering, why does he have so much water up there? Well, allergies are the reason I have so much water. So give me just a second. <laughs> I'm going to take a chance and leave this open. The last time I did that, it did not end well for my Bible, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> so say a little prayer. Let's keep singing. Why don't you stand up with me for this one?
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love Shame no longer has a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your life doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. And this power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save Power in your name Power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. standing in your shows how much he loves me and the empty grave shows his power so why am I afraid of anything else where there is no way God makes a way you are here moving in our midst I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, sing to him, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship I worship you, you are here, you're working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, we make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, a promise people, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, 
touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. service, Lord God, that DJ's words will be your words alone. As I always say that, Lord, please till up the soil of our hearts so that we can receive your good seed and it will grow into something magnificent and glorious for you and your kingdom, Lord God. Use us today as you see fit. Help us be your love and light in someone's life today. Help us point someone to you today, Lord. We give you this day and we thank you for the gift that it is. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> You've heard the old saying, straight from the horse's mouth. This message is coming to you straight from the fish's belly by way of the froggy throat. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. When last we left Jonah, he was sinking in the sea. I appreciate uh, Pastor Bruce speaking for me a few weeks ago when we were at, down at the beach, and it was really cool to be able to hear him 
talking about Peter walking on the waves while I was walking in the waves. Uh, not on the waves, but in the waves. And that was really a, a cool moment for me. But uh, just in the timing of the Lord, his uh, message dealt with Peter on the waves, sinking into the waves. And we're looking this morning at Jonah way beneath the waves. How did he get there? He got there because of his own rebellion. He got there because he didn't want to do what God had called him to do. Well, in a sense, he, he did want to be a prophet. He, he had the vocation part down, but he just wasn't real happy with the location of God's calling in that season of his life. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. Lord willing, we're going to see in a few weeks why he didn't want to go to Nineveh, but he certainly didn't want to end up where he ended up, in the belly of a great fish. Chapter 1 of Jonah, verse 17 says, The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was, not Joni, but Jonah, that was his twin sister, Joni. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God called Jonah to go to the pagan city of Nineveh, and instead he ran in the opposite direction. He tried to get a boat to go, probably the city was located in Spain, modern-day Spain. But God was already prepared for his disobedience, and in fact, what God decided to do was take his rebellion. And as we'll see today and going forward, turn his rebellion into a beautiful picture of his grace, God's grace. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 12 would say that Jonah and the belly of the great fish was a prophetic picture of the gospel. Isn't it amazing that God took one man's rebellion and instead of throwing that man to the sharks, he threw him to the great fish, and in fact, he used that as an illustration of the ultimate act of grace. Jesus Christ, the infinite, eternal, all-powerful Son of God, humbling himself to the womb of a young virgin girl to be born the sinless, perfect man, the Son of God and yet Son of Man, who would grow up and live a sinless life and die on the cross a substitutionary death, not for his own sin, he didn't have any, but for your sin, for my sin. And to prove he was dead, to be buried for three days, and then to prove he is God, to walk out of that tomb alive forevermore. What we see in the book of Jonah here in chapter 2 is a prophetic picture of God's grace. And it's a reminder that you are not beyond the grace of God today. You're not. If you are a child of God, running from Him, rebellious, obstinate, God has a fish prepared for you. And if you are not a child of God today, it doesn't matter what sin is in your present or in your past, Grace can be in your future if you will humble yourself and admit that you're a sinner who needs the only Savior God has provided, Jesus Christ, who proved his love for you by dying on a cross for you, proved his power over sin, death, and the grave by rising from the dead. And now he offers you forgiveness of sins and eternal life, not based on any works you can do, not based on baptism, not based on what you give to the church based solely on His grace. And there's only one way to receive it, and that's by faith. That's a picture that we're going to look at this morning in this great fish that was prepared for Jonah. Now, we say it's a great fish. The Hebrew word that's used here is really the word for sea monster. It it can mean giant fish, but it is a general term, not a scientific term. Most likely, this was a whale. 
it has traditionally been called a whale. We can't say that dogmatically, but by calling it a fish, God is not saying it wasn't a whale. Remember, he's talking to a specific group of people at a specific time in history, and the point was the picture of a ginormous sea creature, not that the fact that he uses the term fish, and well, today we, we know that a whale is categorized differently. That's not the point that uh, God is making here. This very likely was a whale. And while certainly anything is possible with God, this is not the only time in history where a man was swallowed by a whale and lived. Did you know in 19... 19- 27, the Princeton Theological Review reported on two known cases of men from the 1700s. These are documented cases of men who were swallowed whole by a whale and lived. Once in 1758 and another time in 1771. But there's maybe even a more remarkable story with even more documentation. This has been uh, followed up by a couple of scientists in, the, in that day who wanted to make sure this was an actual event and this wasn't just some uh, sailor story. But in February of 1891, on a ship called the Star of the East near the Falkland Islands, a man named James Bartley was working as a whaler and he and another man fell off of the boat as they were harpooning the whale. And neither one of them came back up. And this whale was eventually speared and harpooned and caught and dragged on to the boat. And the men said their goodbyes to James Bartley, or so they thought. They worked on the whale all day and all night and into the next day, cutting that blubber off. And then suddenly the next day, this whale that had been dead for over a day, started to move. And they started to hear noises from inside the whale, and then they began cutting with some fervency, and lo and behold, out rolled James Bartley. His skin stained white by the stomach acids of the whale, and he was in a state of shock. But he was very much alive. This is not an impossibility even without a supernatural act of God. But certainly, Jonah was kept in the whale long enough, or whatever great fish it was, long enough so that this was not just luck that he was spit out by the great fish. He was kept in long enough to show that this was an act of God. This was an act of divine mercy on his life. And we're going to see the prayer that Jonah prayed from the belly of the great fish this morning. As we look at Jonah chapter 2, I I want to give you just a couple of insights on this word repentance that the Bible talks about so much. When Jesus rose from the dead, before he ascended into heaven, he met with the disciples a number of times. And in Luke 24, he tells the disciples, this is the resurrected Jesus, walked out of the grave. He says, guys, you're going to go share the gospel, and here's what you're going to preach. You're going to preach repentance. You're going to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. I'm convinced there are many people in the church today who don't understand that they're not saved because they prayed a prayer that somebody told them to pray. They walked an aisle. Maybe they were sprinkled. Maybe they were even dunked. And somebody told them, you're saved. And they even called Jesus their Savior, but they have zero clue what Jesus has saved them from. Friend, Jesus did not just die to save you from hell. Hell is just the consequence of the problem. The problem is your sin. The problem is your sin. Jesus came to save us from sin. And repentance does not mean that you fix yourself. 
That's not what repentance is. The word repent means to change your mind. I used to believe this, and I've changed my mind, and now I believe this. The, the process of changing your mind, the Greek word is persuasion. It's translated as faith. The word faith, pistis, means to be persuaded. I used to believe this, but now I place my faith in Jesus Christ, and now I've changed my mind. I used to think I was good enough to get to heaven by myself. But now I place my faith in Christ's work, not my works. And now I understand that it's only by God's grace. How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's what God's word tells us. We can choose to believe it or not. When you allow God's word to change your mind, that's called faith. I trust what God's word says. So if you're here today or listening today and you've never admitted that you're a sinner and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ and in him alone for your forgiveness of sins you're not saved yet but you can be but you can be and it's as simple as admitting that you're a sinner and that Jesus is the savior who died for your sin and rose again and paid the price and receiving his payment for your sin by faith Paul says in Romans 10 whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved But that doesn't mean that we don't need to repent as Christians. We're not talking about a man who's not saved yet. We're talking about a man who was a, for a long time had been a faithful prophet. The Old Testament speaks highly of him as a faithful prophet of God. But sometimes as Christians, we get rebellious. We forget that old nature is still with us. We don't want to do what God is told us to do we rebel like some of you rebelled as kids like some of your kids have rebelled for those of you who are parents doesn't mean that we get kicked out of the family but it means there's a broken fellowship with God and so this morning the belly of the fish is a place of preparation a prepared place of preparation. Preparation for what? Of painful protection. Painful protection. What, had ha- what, what would have happened to Jonah if God had not sent the great fish? I don't know how long you can hold your breath, but not that long. Jonah was about to go to the underworld Literally, not just emotionally. But God sent a great fish to protect him. But listen, listen, God's protection was not without pain. Some of you are in a place right now, and I'm not speaking to anyone in particular. The Holy Spirit knows. You're in a place right now that God has put you there for your own protection, but it is not comfortable. It is a painful place. Sometimes God allows, sometimes. Not all trials are punishment. Not all trials are discipline for sin. Job's trials had nothing to do with his sin. Nothing. We go through trials because in this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. But sometimes our troubles are a result of our own sin and sometimes our troubles are a direct result of God's divine intervention in disciplining that sin there are seasons Jesus said in John 15 seasons of pruning he used the illustration of the vineyard and sometimes God prunes us and he pulls us out of where we are and puts us in a place where we can be protected and where we can grow, but it's not without pain because the pruning process is a cutting process and sometimes God cuts some things out of our life and that does not feel good. Sometimes he uses a job that we don't want but we need. Sometimes God uses a physical issue or an illness that limits us and hinders us from sinning from doing the thing that we were going to do and then this physical issue came up or this financial trial came up and God hinders us and it's 
a place of protection, but it's a place of pruning. It's a painful protection. And I point you again to verse 17 of chapter 1. For every human action, God has a perfect and sovereign pre-action. God doesn't react to anything. You realize that? God doesn't react. He pre-acts. He pre-acts. There are times when, uh, uh, as a father, there are times when, as a teacher, there are times when, as a social worker, I could watch a kid, I knew what he was about to do. And I was already trying to plan ahead for how I'm going to respond to what I know what he's going to do. Now, that's a very imperfect picture of God because he knows the future. He, in fact, God says, I declare the end from the beginning. God is not surprised by your rebellion. He's already got a plan in place, prepared for you. So, let's talk to those of us, and if you're not there, you're a sinner, you will be. Let's talk about those of us who are under God's discipline or how to react when we get under God's discipline because none of us are sinless. First John chapter 1 says, if you, if you guys think that because you're a Christian now that you don't need to worry about your sin, you are deceived. You are going to sin. John says in uh, chapter 2 of 1 John, I'm writing these things so you don't sin, but I know you're going to. So here's what you do. You go to the high priest, Jesus Christ your advocate in heaven, who's the propitiation. You came to church expecting a big Bible word, right? There it is for the morning. Propitiation, the substitutionary payment for our sin, and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. So how do we react to affliction? How do we respond with repentance? That's what we're going to look at this morning Let's read this. It's only seven verses, or excuse me, it's only ten verses. Let's read chapter two, uh, verses one through seven, and uh, then we'll make some comments. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. And out of the belly of Sheol, hell in the King James, Sheol, the place of the dead, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. And then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. You ever been on a roller coaster? You wanted to get off? Maybe when you were a kid, maybe it was the first time. Get off. Stop. The, stop. It, you know, you're going to the end. You are riding this ride until it stops. Jonah is riding the great fish down to the depths. Can you imagine the... I mean, the sickening sensation of that, the terror, the fear, the darkness, not knowing where you're going, yet, but God, but the Lord, yet that hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and the, my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple let me give you some some instructions here this morning some responses of the repentant what do i need to do when i find myself in the painful place of the discipline of the lord number one you need to call out to the lord you need to call out to him you need to pray say that's kind of obvious isn't it well why don't we do it why don't we do it why do we blog about it? Why do we post about it? Why do we call our friends about it? Why do we complain about it to everyone but the Lord? Why do we avoid Him? We know why. Because we don't want to deal with the issue. We don't want to deal with the sin. We want to fix it ourselves. We want to show God that we can sin and get away with it. We think. But the Lord is already prepared for our sin. And I'm talking to those of us who are Christians now. Call out to him. Call out to the Lord. 
God says to the prophet Jeremiah, call out to me and I will answer you. I'll show you things you can't even imagine. I will hear you when you call. Call out to the Lord. Number two, right along with it, expect an answer. Don't call out to the Lord and think he won't answer. If you are a child of God and you are sincere in seeking him, he will answer you. Don't be double minded, James says, asking something God promised to give you, but then not expecting it. We don't see more answers to prayer because we, we don't pray with faith. We pray to check a box. I said the prayer and then I tried to fix it myself. No, no, no. Expect God to answer. Expect him to answer. Call out to him. Expect an answer. Don't be double minded. And number three, when you call out to him and when you expect an answer, number three, be honest about your desperation. Be honest with God. Be transparent. Talked with a woman years ago now whose husband had died tragically in a work-related accident. And she was sharing with me about her prayer life. And it was like she felt convicted. She's like, I just, I just let God know. Do you think he still loves me? <laughs> I said, have you read the Psalms? Have you read the Psalms? God already knows what you think. God already knows how you feel. Be honest with him. He wants you to be honest with him. I said, now, don't be a fool and don't speak to him disrespectfully. Don't, don't dare him to up the discipline. But you're, you're hurting, you're in pain. You let the Lord know that. You don't, don't try to hide that from God. He knows you better than you know yourself. In our Sunday morning Bible study class, we looked today briefly at Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? God says, uh, I can. I know your heart. I know your heart better than you know your heart. So don't think you can hide things. If you're angry with me, you tell me. Now listen, I will tell you this from personal experience. There was a time that I was uh, really angry with God about uh, something. I, I don't, I'm not going to take the time to go into the whole thing. The whole issue. I was really, and I just, in my prayers, I just said, God, you, you've not answered this, and you, you failed me, blah, blah, blah. And I did not hear an audible voice, but I heard the Holy Spirit. Let me show you why you failed me, not I failed you. And he showed me. And it was not a fun time of prayer for me. As I realized, the Holy Spirit began to bring things into focus in my life. Here's what you got to change, and we're not putting it off, DJ, any longer. Let him know. Be honest about your desperation. Now, we know from verse 7 that when Jonah says in verse 2 that I cried from the belly of hell, that he wasn't really in, he wasn't really dead yet. We know from verse 7. You got to. You got to translate scripture in context, but he felt like he was going to die. He was so sure he was going. I mean, can you blame him? He's riding the belly of the great fish and he can't see where he's going, but his stomach tells him that he is traveling fast in the wrong direction under the sea. The waves, the speed, the sensation of just being trapped in, in the in the belly of the great fish. He thought he was good. He was so sure he was going to die. He says, I'm already there. I'm dead. I'm a dead man. But notice. He's coming to God to fix the problem. He's coming to God. See, be honest about your desperation, but you need to understand that he's the one who's going to fix it. So I need to ask myself, who am I trusting to fix my heart today? Who am I trusting? You say, well, God, let this happen to me. God allowed this. And again, let me, I, I want to stress this. Not every trial is because of your sin. I, I want to make sure that is crystal clear. Not every, well, this is a cursed world, cursed by sin. That's why we have death and sickness. That's why we break our bones. That's why we have broken relationships. It's not all my sin. It's sin in general that is the cause of that. But regardless of whether it's, the sin problem or my sin problem. He's the one who's going to fix my heart. 
He's the one who can bring healing. And we numb it. We saw in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 this morning in my Bible study, wine is a mocker. Some people turn to alcohol. I'll just numb the pain. I'll try to ignore the pain. I'll try to push it aside for a while. It's a mocker. It, it, pain's not going anywhere. It's coming right back with a vengeance. It's coming right back. Don't try to. You, he's the only one who can fix your heart. He's the only one who can heal your heart. So number four, you have to embrace the Father's discipline. For those of us who are struggling because of discipline, there is no healing without repentance. There's no healing without repentance. There's no healing without understanding that this is God's discipline that has been brought into my life because this problem that I have called a problem that is really a rebellion in my life that I have not been dealing with, and God says we're going to deal with it today And we're going to deal with it tomorrow. We're going to deal with it until it is done. Until we realize that the pain is because of discipline. We're going to be confused. We're going to be disappointed. We're going to be fearful. Embrace the father's discipline. Look at verse three again. Thou hast cast me into thou hast cast me into the deep. All thy billows Thy waves passed over me. I am cast out of thy sight. What will... Didn't chapter 1 tell us that Jonah wasn't just running from Nineveh? What else was Jonah running from? The presence of the Lord. He was running from fellowship with God. That's how he got himself into this situation to begin with. He's cast out of thy sight because of his choices. The fellowship is broken because of his choices. Nevertheless, he says, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews quotes the book of Proverbs, but then he adds some commentary to that divinely inspired commentary when he says, don't forget that God disciplines you. Don't ignore when God disciplines you and and don't despise it either. Don't think because God's discipline disciplining me it means he doesn't love me no 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 the discipline is the evidence that he loves you the writer says if god isn't disciplining you you are illegitimate and not a true child of god you just think you're saved if you can sin and not be disciplined by god so embrace the father's discipline embrace it learn from it respond to it don't try to ignore it and don't be discouraged by it Don't mock it. Don't forget it. Embrace it. And number five, verses four again. Allow your pain to point you back to God's presence. Allow your pain to point you to God's presence. Now, at this time in history, there was an actual temple physically built. The book of Hebrews says it was just a model just a model of the of the temple in heaven but god's presence actually dwelt in that temple in the holy of holies actually dwelt there god in his grace placed his pre- manifested his presence on the ark of the covenant in the holy of holies and so there is a temple there is a place of god's presence and Jonah says, I want, that, I want to be back at that presence. I will look again towards thy hill. I've been running from your presence, God, but I want to be back there. Now, Christian, brother, sister, if you know Jesus Christ, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, and you are not your own. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. Temple is, will be rebuilt there, but it ain't there yet. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He is as close as a prayer for you to confess your sin. And if you confess your sin, he is faithful 
and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness and to bring back that fellowship. That doesn't mean you get all of your privileges right back, but to restore the fellowship of the Father. But you have to allow your pain to point you back to Him. You have to allow your pain to point you back to God's presence. Friend, how easily are you discouraged from pursuing the presence of God? How easily are you distracted from pursuing the very presence of God? He is with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you, Jesus promised. So how easily are you distracted? How easily are you discouraged? See, Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please Him. Because when we come to Him, we have to believe that He is But we also have to believe that he rewards those who not just seek him, diligently seek him. Not just when it's convenient, not just when we have extra time in the evening and nothing else to do, but that he is the priority of our heart. Is he my priority? How easy is it? For the devil to distract me, to discourage me. You have to allow your pain to point you to God's presence. And I'm just going to tell you, sometimes the pain hasn't gone yet because you haven't refocused yet. And God loves you enough. Sometimes he's going to turn up the heat. He's going to turn up the pressure until you get your eyes back on him. Just telling you. We don't know when Jonah started praying this prayer. I I suspect it it was fairly quickly, but it might might not have been as quick because he's a pretty stubborn man, unlike most of us. That's sarcasm. Number six, when you pray, confess God's faithfulness. Confess his faithfulness. Verses 5 and 6 again. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. O Lord my God. Confess his faithfulness. When we are faithless, Paul tells Timothy, he remains faithful. He can't despise himself. You are as a child of God. He has placed his name on you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He has placed his name on me. He's placed his spirit in me. He has invested eternally in me. I matter to him. So don't think that he is faithless like you are. Don't think that he will betray you like you betray him. Or like others have betrayed you. He is faithful. So confess his grace and his power. No sin is greater than the resurrection power of the Savior. I love Romans chapter 8. It it is a diamond of all the diamonds in the Bible. It, It is one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible, especially for those of us who are already saved. It is a tremendous place of promise. And one of those great promises is that if the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in you, You think God can't deal with your sin, your mortal bodies? You think God can't deal with with your addictions and your habits and your your chains? You think God can't make a way, can't break that chain? It's so strong. He walked out of the grave. Resurrection power, the same power, Paul says, lives inside of you. Now, that doesn't mean that he just snaps his finger and all the pain goes away. It doesn't mean that he doesn't... uh, ask us to work and discipline it and do our part to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But it means that he promises us the power to do it. So confess his faithfulness. And number seven, remember that Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is Savior. Jesus is High Priest. See, Jonah knew him as Yahweh, knew him as Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. You get to know him even better than Jonah, the prophet. You get to know him as Yah's salvation. Yahuwah. Jesus, as we say in English. Yah's salvation, the Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord, the Savior. You get to know him as Jesus. So, a couple quick questions. Are you submitting to him as Lord? Am I submitting to him as my Lord, as the Lord, as the creator of all the universe? The image of the first, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created. All things were created by him and for him. And do I know him as Savior? And do I know him as my merciful high priest look again at verses six and seven i went down to the bottoms verse seven but when my soul fainted within me i remembered the lord and my prayer came unto thee into thine holy temple he is your lord he is your savior and he remains your high priest so when you repent praise him for those things honor him for those things. Don't forget his mercies, which are new every morning. Jeremiah says in the book of Lamentations, God, your mercies are new every morning, Lord. Great is thy faithfulness unto me. Remember Jesus, your Lord, Savior, and High Priest. I lo- I'm not going to take the time to go to Titus chapter 3, but I love Titus chapter 3. Another great, another one of Paul's great Holy Spirit inspired sermon, mini sermons. Titus, remember as you deal with the sinners in your life and the the wickedness of the world around you, remember that that was us without Jesus. There but for the grace of God, Titus, go you and me. But when the kindness of God, when when the mercy of God When the grace and love of God appeared, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but it's all his mercy. It's all his grace. It's all his love. So remember that and lean into that when you are being disciplined by God. And number eight, bear the fruits. Bear the fruits. Repentance is not, God, get me out of the fish so I can go on my merry way. Head head to Tarshish. Repentance is, get me out of this fish so I can do what you asked me to do. Get back on mission and go to Nineveh. Look at verses 8 and 9. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy but i will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving i will pay that that i have vowed salvation is of the lord so three things here Uh, john the baptist told the pharisees this who pretended to repent and we know from their fruit just shortly thereafter that the vast majority of them had not really repented john said to them you better bear the fruits that are worthy of repentance. Don't just show up here, you bunch of snakes. Get get dunked in the water, make some kind of, observe some kind of religious ritual and think that you're right with God. Bear the fruits. What do you do to do that? You forsake your idols. An idol is anything you, you are trusting in more than God. Anything that is more of a priority in your life than God. That's your idol. Forsake the idols. Because if you don't, Jonah says, you're forsaking the mercy that God is offering you. Your cho- the choice is yours. You can keep your idol or you can get God's mercy. You can keep your idol and ride the, the great fish to the very end. Or you can receive the mercy that God is offering to you. The choice is yours today. I have set before you today death and life. 
I've said you before you today, blessing and cursing. And God says, choose life. Choose life that you might live. Sacrifice to God alone from the heart. Because the idol's gone, so I'm not making sacrifices for that anymore. I'm making sacrifices for God. And keep your commitments. And here's the, here's the proof with thanksgiving. I do it. I continue to do it. And I'm giving thanks. I'm not regretting. Oh, I got it. Dude, God made me do this. And I'm so. Right? Like the student who told the teacher, the teacher said, sit down, sit down, sit down. Finally, the kid sat down, looked at the teacher and said, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. Yeah, God knows your heart. So what happens when we do these things? What happens? Does God pull out the rug? Does God say, ah, tricked you? Look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Uh, this picture, I, I love, it's a beautiful picture, but it, there's uh, something very notable that's missing from this picture. You know, know what it is? The vomit. The vomit. I've st- we, were at the, we were at the beach a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm still finding sand and stuff, all right? You think all that stuff just washed off as he's walking out of that? No, sir. He was a mess when he came. So, look, it's going to take some time to get you cleaned up, okay? You repent. The mess does not just disappear. But God will help you clean up, too. God will help you clean it up. Whatever it is, if it's a sexual issue, a financial issue, if it's a a commitment issue, a communication issue, whatever the issue, God will help you clean it up. It'll take time. But God's faithfulness is that he will get you back on dry land. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to this stubborn, disobedient servant. God, because all of us at some time or another have been stubborn, disobedient servants. God, I pray if there's a stubborn, disobedient servant here today, that they would not leave here, not leave this room before they have dealt with their sin and dealt with you. And God, if there's somebody here today, they, they're not your servant. May they realize today, may today be the day they realize salvation is not of works. Salvation is not of avoiding it. Salvation is only of the Lord, and Jesus is the way that you provide it. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, the altars are open. Our deacons are here, are available to pray with you if you need prayer. If you have a decision you need to make right where you are, let's not leave here before we've dealt with the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, O
that chorus. Let's sing it one more time. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great you that even though when we are faithless you still remain faithful God we see it in Israel's history all day long you stretched out your hand to a disobedient obstinate people God we know though that even as your children we can still stray we can still rebel we can still God wander in our hearts from you thank you God we praise you for your faithfulness Father, we just pray, God, that others, our friends, our family, God, the kids who will be here for VBS, those who are there when our our team goes down to minister at the mission, God, that others will see your great love, your great faithfulness, God, and place their faith and trust in you, God, that your spirit would even be working in those hearts right now. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a need, I'll still be here for a while up front. Hope that you'll come back tonight and stay for the Father's Day ice cream social. God bless. You are dismissed.